G.K. Chesterton's The Maniac is the second chapter of his book, Orthodoxy. The first chapter is really the book's introduction and is less than five pages long, so The Maniac is the first significant installment of Chesterton's argument. In it, he takes on many topics, materialism, logic, imagination, reason, insanity, freedom, and determinism, to name a few. This wide-ranging content is common to Chesterton's freewheeling style. As a journalist, he was accustomed to stuffing large thoughts into small packages, a few column inches of newspaper print. This does not mean that Chesterton's essay is a jumble of miscellaneous ideas. In fact, it's anything but a jumble. Chesterton is, however, a genius, and following him can sometimes be a challenge. It's not that any particular point is esoteric. Usually, it seems just the opposite. His individual arguments seem simple, even obvious. Nevertheless, if a reader follows the thread that runs through the dizzying maze of thoughts, that reader will find a carefully woven fabric, an argument that unfolds meticulously. In The Maniac, Chesterton uses a chance discussion with the publisher to show the outlines of his attack on George Bernard Shaw's notion of the Superman, one who has no obligations to God or gods, who makes his own world without any transcendent, transcendent constraints. Shaw was a Fabian, a member of a British socialist organization who thought that socialism or communism, the same, only different, should replace capitalism. Fabians saw socialism and communism as one thing. The only difference is that socialists believed a gradual process could transform society, but communists following Karl Marx preached that a violent and cataclysmic revolution was coming. Communism would be imposed on the world by the masses. Socialism could be imposed gradually by government decree. Chesterton argues that these materialists, such as Shaw, have succumbed to a kind of madness, a small, closed system of one thought that explains everything but understands nothing. The visceral reaction Chesterton has to his publisher friend's quip that, that man will get on, he believes in himself, is pregnant with meaning. Believing in oneself is no proof for Chesterton. He retorts that madmen believe in themselves against a sane world. This colorful illustration is entertaining, but the point is clearly deeper. The materialists, like Shaw, deny God or any reality outside of the material world. Only matter and its movements exist. Chesterton contends that this is a suffocatingly small world, no matter how strongly the materialists believe it. Three centuries earlier, philosopher René Descartes famously postulated that thoroughgoing doubt needed to be the basis for a human thought. At bedrock, Descartes claimed a sure foundation exists. I think, therefore I am. For Chesterton, the narcissistic world Descartes constructs is madness. It builds on two defective foundations, doubt and man. The materialists, such as Shaw, are trying to build on Descartes' foundation. But what they build is a prison house of one idea that leads to the asylum and, as history also shows, it leads to the gulag. When Chesterton illustrates his point about a suffocating dogma, he chooses a modern Marxian socialist, socialist who denies man's free will. Chesterton's point is that Marxists deny what is obviously true. People make choices all the time, so free will exists. Our everyday language shows this when we ask, would you please pass the mustard? One may or may not respond to the request, but Marxist dogma is deterministic. Free will is impossible inside the system. Marxists claim that people are products of their class. They act from dominant social forces from within their economic circumstances. And Marx believed that the triumph of the working class was inevitable. The communist revolution was certain and the future already known. Chesterton saw that such thinkers were reasonable only in the sense that they could explain the world with their theories. What they had lost was connection with reality. They had gone insane with their reasonable explanations, and the madman is the man who has lost everything except his reason. The madman's logical system is complete in itself, so it is impossible to untangle someone while still inside the delusion. Chesterton explains it this way. Such is the madman of experience. 
He is commonly a reasoner, frequently a successful reasoner. Doubtless, he could be vanquished in mere reason and the case against him put logically, but it can be put much more precisely in more general and even aesthetic terms. He is in the clean and well-lit prison of one idea. He is sharpened to one painful point. He is without healthy hesitation and healthy complexity. George Bernard Shaw's mental fixation with socialism led him to defend Joseph Stalin and deny the reality of the arrests, purges, show trials, and gulag prison camps in the Soviet Union, though the evidence was right in front of his face. Shaw had traveled to the Soviet Union during the government-orchestrated famine that killed millions of Soviet citizens, but he could only report bumper crops and agricultural planning quotas successfully met. He had become a prisoner of hopes and dreams. His mind, moving in a perfect but narrow ideological circle, explained away what his eyes and ears were trying to reveal to him. Chesterton warns his readers that the maniac cannot think himself out of a mental evil, for it is actually the organ of thought that has become diseased, ungovernable, and as it were, independent. The closed system contains all the important information, all the relevant answers. Nothing else can get in. Still, as Chesterton writes, if the cosmos of the materialist is the real cosmos, it is not much of a cosmos. Chesterton also warns his readers in The Maniac, a decade before the communist revolution in Russia will take place, that materialism's fatalist doctrine is quite as likely to lead to cruelty as it is certain to lead to cowardice. Why is this so? Economic determinists cannot appeal to a man's will, which is fixed by his station in society, by his economic condition, by his class membership. Instead, men can be put in boiling oil and eliminated. Chesterton seems eerily prescient in this section of his critique on materialism. He has predicted Marxist materialism's coming in humanity. Whole classes of people would need to be eliminated. Capitalists, the wealthy, business owners, landlords, foreign-born, foreign-educated, kulaks, or private farmers and all counter-revolutionaries. And there's no escape from materialism's criminal classes. When state officials come for former business owners, these folks cannot repent or be given absolution. They are class enemies and must be punished not only for what they specifically did, but for who they are. This is an immutable stain that can be cleansed only by blood, the offender's blood. Forgiving a former class enemy is tantamount to joining the counter-revolutionaries. The workers are the angels, an enemy of everyone else. Moreover, the Marxist state gets to say who is and who is not a worker. So if you were a private farmer with a tiny farm, and if you had ever hired another laborer to help you in the field, you instantly became a kulak and had joined the ranks of the unforgiven. You were an enemy of the state, an enemy of the people. You must be arrested or eliminated, or both. Chesterton, like Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who will come to Chesterton's position in another four decades, sees that materialism itself breeds a social evil that corrodes society's social fabric. Chesterton was personal friends with George Bernard Shaw. They frequently debated. Chesterton had great respect and regard for Shaw, but he saw that Shaw's ideas were like acid. They could destroy civilization if they went unchecked and were ever absorbed by the general society. A materialist society might look superficially like any other society, but beneath the surface, the houses, the shops, the factories, and the government offices are filled with beings who look human, but have been drained of their essential humanity. They believe in nothing but themselves, and anything, any inhumanity, is possible.